So we're good to go? Uh, Just a second. I'll test it out here. See how the audio sounds. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Man, I sound great on camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I sound on camera. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like I talk about my with us and the readies are with us. It, no, I, I sound like I talk about my nose. Actually, no one talks out of my nose. <laughs> 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 to some extent. I talk with my nose calm. <laughs> Alright, are we ready to go? Yep, we are, we're streaming. Okay, and we need to get to the... record. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. All right, well, good to see everybody here, and good to have you joining us online if you're out there. Oh. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> if you're out there. Difficulty. I think we got it worked out, hopefully, and hopefully it'll maintain throughout the time together. We can hope. Let me just uh, invite everybody to pause a sec, and then we'll go to the morning prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much for uh, watching over us yet through another week. Uh, so many things we take for granted, but you're always there keeping an eye on us, protecting us, prompting us, convicting us, and forgiving us. And so, Lord, we're just thankful that you're there always. It's that time again when we come to you, uh, particularly on your day, uh, your special time. We know that. Uh, we honor you like this, that we receive a special blessing for it. We pray that each person watching or listening will definitely receive that blessing today. We uh, trust your Holy Spirit to come and to inspire us with our study. We're asking, Lord, for special wisdom and insight. We need everything that we can possibly receive from you in order to get through this life and to be prepared for your soon return. We're hoping that and praying, the one that you will prepare us for that hour. Bless, uh, bless all those who are watching and listening and uh, all of our friends and loved ones out there. We do pray, Lord, that you would consider our prayer list and that your will will be accomplished in that and uh, in each of the cases. Uh, we know you're a miracle-working God and we're thankful that we serve a God who is more than able. So bless uh, the folks according to your will, we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Okay. We're going to go ahead and continue with our story. I'm not sure what chapter like we're on. And uh, after that, I'm well, just going to continue with our <coughs> studies through mm. marriage. Take it away. It's not okay. Oh, okay. I didn't get a chance to kind of pull all this up because we were frantically right. trying to get the stream working. Well, just a shout out to all those who are uh, going to be in the path of this pretty severe storm that's headed their way in the Midwest. Shout. What shout. did they have? Uh, <laughs> Thirty. <laughs> so I want to give a shout out to all my bros out on the west. <laughs> how many? Uh, <laughs> how many uh, tornadoes yesterday? Thirty. Nebraska and Kansas reported Nebraska. yesterday in one day. So, wow. You folks, uh, even when the system has just started, and they're saying that the, the day is going to be even worse into tomorrow. Hope you're hunkering down there and hope that uh, God will watch That's over you folks out there. <coughs> so, it seems like the weather is becoming more intense. Yeah. Yeah. What chapter are we on? Chapter 14. Okay, chapter 14 in Peretti's book. And <coughs> Well, thought Marshall, sooner or later I have to get around to it. On Thursday afternoon, when things were quiet, he closed himself in his office and made some phone calls trying to track down Professor Julian Langstrat. He called the college, got the number for the psych department, went through two receptionists in two different offices, before he finally found out that Langstrat was not in today and had an unlisted home number. Then he thought of the very cooperative Albert Darr and gave his office a ring. Professor Dar was teaching, but he would return his call if he would leave a message, so he left a message. Two hours later, Albert Dar returned Marshall's call, and he did have the unlisted number for Julian Langstrat's apartment. Marshall called the number, but it was busy. In the living room of Julian Langstrat's apartment, the room was dimly lit by one small lamp on the mantel. 
The room was quiet and warm and comfortable. The shades were drawn to block out distractions, bright light, and any other disturbances, and the phone was off the hook. She sat in her chair, speaking quietly to her counselee who sat opposite her. You hear only the sound of my voice, she said, then repeated that sentence several times quietly and clearly. You hear only the sound of my voice. This went on for several minutes until her subject was in a deep hypnotic trance. You are descending, descending deep within yourself. She watched the face of her subject carefully. She then extended her hands, palms out, fingers spread, and began to move her hands up and down just inches away from the subject's body, as if feeling for something. Release your true self. Let it go. It is infinite, at unity with all existence. Yes, I can feel it. Can you read my energy returning to you? The subject murmured, yes. You are free from your body now. Your body is an illusion. You feel the bounds of your body dissolving away. She leaned in close, still using her hands. You are free now. Yes, yes, I am free. I can feel your life force expanding. Yes, I can feel it. That's enough. You may stop there. Langstrat was intent, closely observing everything. Go back, go back. Yes, I can feel you receding. In a moment, you will feel me slipping from you, but don't be alarmed. I'm still here. <clears throat> In the next several minutes, she brought her subject slowly back out of the trance, step by step, suggestion by suggestion. Finally, she said, all right, when I count to three, you will awake. One, two, three. Sandy Hogan opened her eyes, rolled them about dizzily, and then took a deep breath, coming fully around. Wow, she responded. The three of them laughed together. Wasn't that something, asked Sean, sitting next to Langstrat. Wow, was all Sandy could say. This was a real first for Sandy. It had been Sean's idea, and though she hesitated at first, now she was very glad she had gone along with it. The apartment shades were opened, and Sandy and Sean prepared to go back to their afternoon classes. Well, thank you for coming, said the professor at the door. Thank you, Sandy piped. And thank you for bringing her, Langstrat told Sean. Then she said to the two of them, Now remember, I wouldn't advise speaking to anyone about this. It is a very personal and intimate experience that we should all respect. Yeah, right, right, said Sandy. And Sean drove her back to campus. There's a little break here. It was Friday again, and Hank sat in his little corner office at home looking anxiously at the clock. Mary was usually very reliable. She said she would be back before Carmen got here for her afternoon counseling appointment. Hank had no idea if there were any spies watching the house, but he could never be sure. And all he needed was for someone to figure out that Carmen was dropping in to see him while Mary went grocery shopping. Hank's fearful side could envision all kinds of plots his enemies might form against him, such as sending some strange and seductive woman to compromise and ruin him. Well, he knew one thing. If Carmen didn't show genuine responsiveness to the counseling and begin to apply real solutions to a real problem, that would be the end of it as far as he was concerned. <clears throat> oh, oh, there was the doorbell. He sneaked to look out the window. Carmen's red Fiat was parked out front. Yes, she was standing at the door in broad daylight, in full view of 10 or 15 houses. The way she was dressed quickly, dressed today, made Hank figure he'd better let her in quickly, if only to get her out of sight. Where, where was Mary? Mary was not sure she liked the new owners of what used to be Joe's Market. It wasn't their service or the way they ran the store, or whether or not they were friendly. They were okay in most of those departments, and Mary figured it would take time for them to get to know everyone and vice versa. What bothered her was how obviously secretive they became any time she asked what became of Joe Carlucci and his family. As far as Mary could find out, Joe, Angelina, and their children left Ashton abruptly and didn't tell anyone, and so far no one could be found who even knew where they went. She hurried out of the store and her, toward her car, a young box boy pushing a cart of groceries behind her. She opened the trunk and watched the boy load the groceries in. And then she felt it, suddenly without any apparent reason, an unexplainable tinge of emotion, an odd mixture of fear and depression. She felt cold, nervous, and a little shaky and she could think of nothing but getting out of that place and hurrying home. Triscoll had been accompanying her, guarding her, and he felt it too. With a metallic ring and a flash of light, his sword was instantly in his hand, but too late. From somewhere behind him came a stunning blow on the back of his neck. He toppled forward, and his wings shot out to steady him, 
but an incredible weight came down on his back like a pile driver and pinned him down. He could see their feet, like the clawed feet of hideous reptiles and the red flicker of their blades. He could hear their sulfurous hissing. And he looked up. At least a dozen demonic warriors surrounded him. They were towering, fierce with glowing yellow eyes and dripping fangs, and they were sneering and gargling with laughter. Triscoll looked to see if Mary was all right. He knew her safety would soon be threatened if he didn't act. But what could he do? What was that? He suddenly felt an intense wave of evil rolling over him. Pick him up, said a voice like thunder. A vice-like hand <clears throat> curled around his neck and jerked him up as if he were a toy. Now he was looking at all these spirits eye to eye. They were newcomers to Ashton. He had never seen such size, strength, and brazenness. Their bodies were covered with thick iron-like scales and their arms rippled with power. Their faces mocked and their sulfurous breath was choking him. They turned him around and held him tightly and he found himself face to face with a vision of sheer horror. Flanked by no less than 10 more huge demonic warriors, a gargantuan spirit stood with an S-curved sword in his monstrous hand. For far, the thought coursed through Triscoll's mind like a death sentence. Every inch of his being tightened with the anticipation of blows and defeat, unbearable pain. The big fanged mouth broke into a mocking and hideous grin. Saliva dripped from the fangs and sulfur chugged forth in rancid clouds as the giant warlord chuckled mockingly. Are you so surprised, Rafar asked? You should feel privileged. You, little angel, are the first to look upon me. <clears throat> the battle is beginning. Yeah. I mean, Pretty really is talking about any town in the USA, any, any town in the world, really. <clears throat> where uh, people are dealing with uh, issues uh, and wrapped up in this spiritual controversy of uh, good and evil. And uh, we're all oblivious to it, running around, busy, 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 doing our thing, um, oblivious to the fact that uh, uh, these... Uh, Warriors take things very seriously. I remember uh, one of Ron Wyatt's comments when he was in the chamber and he met an angel in there and spoke to him. And he said there was no jovial, you know, conversation. Like no, he said he was, was very serious as a heart attack. Heart attack serious. I mean, he said it was just very, you know, this is business. So this is, this is we're dealing with eternal issues when it comes to this warfare, and we, we don't recognize it any, any so, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. So. At any rate, we'll pick that up again next week. Um, just giving you a little taste, a little bit of that each week. Uh, just a reminder that that warfare is going on <laughs> wherever you are, in uh, whatever circumstance you're in. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, switch back to Elijah's presentation on marriage, which is uh, something we've been going through. I think what's confusing about this story is that the names are all so weird that nothing distinguishes the angels from like the demons or the humans. Like that's what that's what's hard for me to follow. Yeah, it it's takes, like we're far tall well, because, and like all these random <laughs> names, it's like Triscoll. Yeah, yeah like these, these names are not like Tinkerbell. Right? <laughs> if you could see this, if you could see if it, you it's could how see it the did. screenplay, you would know exactly of the differences. But it's just interesting. That, mm. <clears throat> it also doesn't help that I'm really bad with names, anyways. Like I forgot who Tall was for the longest time. Like I didn't think he was one of the good guys. Was like, that was Frank. one of the reasons when we read it the first time, the kids kept saying, "Another chapter, another chapter." We read like ten chapters in one afternoon because they were really wrong with this story. Mm -hmm. Well, if you we were reading it all at once, you'd probably be able to follow the story yeah. easier because you'd be like, "Oh yeah, Hank was the guy in the last chapter." And the pastor. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't remember who Hank is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you call him Pastor Hank. I don't think I, I still remember that idea. Pastor Hank. Pastor Hank. <laughs> That's the guy. Yeah, so I don't know. It's, I, I feel like the story is easier to follow if you're reading it through, as opposed to splitting it up a week. The time because then you come back to it and you're like I don't remember who Frank was. <laughs> Would you have fun with the story? And get off of this one. How far along are we in the story? Maybe halfway. 
Yeah, one of those, uh, you know, I mean, it's certainly worth considering. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, we, we, can, we can chat about it, because mm -hmm. I, I think I've got a few books as well about different people we can read about as well. I like the first two stories, the Garrett and the Crazy. The biography. Yeah, and like, those are really good, the biographies. I don't mind switching. Well, there's no question that one of the areas that is tremendously under attack these days is marriage and the family. Um, um, and that's why divorce rate in our own country here is well over 50 percent, uh, even among Christian families, well over 50 percent. And uh, it's just something about the thinking of the people that, you know, have come, come along. Uh, I think in the millennial generation, uh, marriage is probably low on the totem pole in terms of standard direction that people should take their lives in. Yeah, and I've got a friend who's a counselor in Texas, a biblical counselor. He says the request for marriage counseling, he says he's never had a time where more people were contacting him about marriage counseling. Because people get married because well, of good. healing more than they get married that's because that's of that's a so his, as, as a counselor, his business struggled for a long time. Mm -hmm. But he said now he is getting requests right now. Because marriages are really being challenged. The Lord's blessing upon him yeah. is everyone's unsuccessful <laughs> marriage. <laughs> well, he, he deals with specific issues. He he tackles pornography and addictions and things like that. And I think there's just a whole lot of that that's out there in the world. People can be addicted just to prescription medications. and It can cause everything to wreak sure. havoc in their family. Well, anyway, time for a lot of people to work. That's true. Addicted to work. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, oh yeah, that's an addiction. Yeah, especially for men. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's very very common thing. Well, their self esteem is usually wrapped up in what they're doing. And then if you're a task oriented person, <laughs> so, <coughs> from that arena. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you're just not pushed up all the way against me. You're schnout. Look at it. He's like muscle type of thing. Scott with us this yeah, week yet. Stretched out all the way, huh? Yeah, stretched as you can be. Okay, so brief overview of what we chatted about last week. Does anybody remember much about it? You were looking at the uh, looking at the, uh, the myths concerning marriage. That people grow up with and the expectations that they had. And of course, I think that's one of the problems. One of the problems that you have within marriage is that you have the man and the woman go into it with certain expectations. And after, they don't talk after about all of the glamour wears off, maybe after a few years, um, and those expectations are not met or not realized, then people start to ask. Doing with this other person. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we definitely we, we addressed a lot of that and um, started to branch into the idea of what we should be and who we should be to be married or to get married. And um, I think part of that branches into the topic of what a godly husband is supposed to be if we're trying to get an idea of what a man should be before he gets married. Doesn't mean that that is what a man is before he gets married. I don't think there's anybody that usually um, captures all these different character traits. You know, I, I, you know, life is obviously this long journey of character development, where you know, as a young man, you start off trying to figure a lot of stuff out, and you're kind of rough around the edges. And eventually, you know, by the time you're a grandpa, you've kind of developed that, <laughs> you know, enough of that character personality to be sweet and to be. Right, and you're trying to survive as well. You're trying to do all the traditional things yeah. that uh, might be expected of you or you think are expected of you. And so it can be a struggle along the way just to survive. Oh, yeah. And live up to those expectations. So, um, so yeah, so, so we're going to kind of be addressing the, the idea, the topic of uh, a man's role in a marriage. 
to know what it what it should be in terms of like what you should be expecting going in. Um, and even even in more recent studies, I found uh, there are aspects I didn't consider when we got married. Not that that's a huge thing, but like you know, the more I've been studying, the more I've been finding uh, bits and pieces. Well, we that find I didn't out realize. how unprepared we really are. Yeah, yeah. That's essentially, what it amounts to is I had what I consider to be some of the prerequisites. You know, um, you know, like I was kind of at my own place, and you know, I I did well enough money-wise that I could support the two of us. You know, those were two things in my head that I kind of felt were not necessarily requirements, but definitely are important. I think. Um, I think they should be requirements. I think that. I'm just speaking from the biblical yeah. perspective. I don't. I didn't see those as being like the required prerequisites. I think they are wise things. They're actually, when you look at the history of marriage in the, in the Bible, mm -hmm. they couldn't get married until the groom had prepared a place, a home. Mm -hmm. So the groom had to have the means and ability to make a home to bring the bride to. So th th there was an assumption of a certain amount of readiness and self-sufficiency. Oh yeah. And he had to have some means of supporting his family before they would give permission to marry. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an. I think that's particularly when it comes to daughters. Mm -hmm. You want the daughters taken care of. You know, it's like the guys are kind of survivalists, you <laughs> yeah. know, in that sense. But, but yeah, he'll find a way. But yeah, daughters. But my little you, girl. You well, and in, in that culture too, women didn't have the freedom to run their own business or be independent. Right. At least not easily. No, it was you not. Find a, people like Lydia or other. Like it seems like there were women who were. There were so women who seemed to be able to do that, but I think they did that within the confines of already being married. And it, it's you know, like the virtuous woman thing sounds a very much like, you know, this was a married woman who was running a type of business as well as running the household. Yeah. But for single women, I don't think there were a lot of options. Yeah. Cool. So. Um, <coughs> So going back to what we had first talked about a couple weeks ago, just branching off from that, you know, I talked about having a knowledge of self, and um, then branching into the question of what type of man or woman does God want me to be. So the first point I wanted to kind of examine that we can discuss is that um, kind of what you were saying earlier with the idea of having a place. As I said, the first thing is you should be ready. You know, just from the perspective of a lot of people who rush to get married who don't realize they're not ready to be married. And so to, to, to answer that more fully, we're going to dig deeper into that idea of how, how we can know we're ready. Because I feel like emotion is a very powerful cloud that, um, that keeps you from answering a lot of important questions. <laughs> You know, you just kind of overlook the complications and the stuff, and you you pass off that feeling <coughs> of nervousness, or you know, I, I think really in a lot of cases it's it's a feeling of not being ready, and people just pass that off as being nervous. Um, so let's see. Um, I think the. What do we think the first thing is, like, but let's say the first requirement of marrying somebody, like, what do you guys think the first requirement would be? <coughs> like, you know, you're going, you're going to go find somebody to marry from the biblical perspective. You know, what's like the first thing you should look for? I would think that from a man's perspective, that would be uh, support. We want to be able to support uh, the relationship. So that, that means, you know, obviously you have to have a job, you have to have an income, mm -hmm. you have to have a place, uh, your place to live. Place to live. Uh, obviously you, you, you'll have to have things. I know uh, Rose and I, what we did, because we knew that we were going to get married, uh, we started putting things on layaway. Those of you who might not know what that is, is where you go to a little store and you just find something that you would like to purchase and you don't have the, the entire purchase amount, so you start paying a little bit at a time and, it, and a 
over time, you end up paying for the thing, and <coughs> eventually you can go pick it up when it's all paid for. So you, you bought it, but you haven't completely paid for it. Totally. In some stores, I don't know if, if stores still technically do that anymore, but this particular furniture store that we, we frequently uh, allow us to do that. And so when we got married, the day that we walked through the door of our first apartment, uh, a lot of our furniture was already paid for. Yeah. Yeah, there's some stores that still do that. But yeah, I think that's important and kind of branching back to maybe it was the first or second study that I started this was uh, just looking at the example of Adam from the very beginning of creation. You know, he had his job, he had his place, right. he had everything established, he was ready for more. You know, he named the animals, he knew his job, he knew his, what he had to do, and God gave him a wife. And it all went down him from <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it was, um, so yeah, so so that's a, that's another important aspect of it. I was gonna say that I think, um, and this is a very simple principle, but I think it's a principle a lot of people overlook, especially my generation, is that they have to be a Christian. You know, uh, the person you're looking at for marriage. Well, if you go back and look in in Deuteronomy, you know the principles for fathers husbands was to be the leader at the, the, the priest of the family mm -hmm. and so for men you know one of the first requirements should be that you have a, a, a God or a Christian experience that you have a connection with the Lord because without that you're not going to succeed very well at anything to begin with mm -hmm. but that also should color the type of person you're looking for because you don't want to be unequally yoked with somebody that doesn't believe the way you do Absolutely. And I was just going to touch on some of those scriptures that we just read briefly because I think they're, they're important ones. Uh, Mama, if you want to look up um, Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And Dad, if you want to find maybe 2 Corinthians six fourteen. That's a simple verse. Very simple, yeah. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Yeah, and I mean, there's um, the context of a lot of, the, of these passages that we're reading is um, seems to be under the context of intermingling spiritually, most particularly. And, um, you know, I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? Like, I don't think there's any, you know, I mean, that's pretty much just a simple, simple fact of life that you won't be able to have somebody you're walking alongside and working with and being in unity with. Um, unless you can agree on the foundational points. Happy to be one if they're not happy to be so Yeah. You might start walking together, but very shortly, when you recognize the differences, you'll be motivated to want to go in a different direction. Yeah. And so, so many people today, it seems like, they find something about another person that they're attracted to. Whether it's the, just the physical aspects of things, or what it might be, or maybe maybe the person one person's very wealthy and somebody's attracted to the idea of, of you know that, that kind of security, mm -hmm. and but then after perhaps a, a relationship develops, you find out man we're like different as night and day, and it ends up uh, it, it's an agreement. Dan and Susan said they both both to be saved equally yoked. <clears throat> so they put on here. There's such a delay with the, the video and when people make comments that I may be popping in with something that's it's fine. We yeah. haven't talked about. Yeah, it's fine. Um, and there's also the problem of people um, trying to find the right person but trying everywhere instead of just, you know, just waiting on God and praying about it. Just want to take matters into their own hands and experiment with everybody and see if they can find someone that will um, satisfy their desire. Yeah, right. someone that of will course, match them. Of course for young men too, that they're hormonal. <laughs> and that, that's a driving motivational force that, that uh, <clears throat> yeah, that would, would, would leave you. 
so I think that's an important point to bring out as well is another prerequisite to marriage is you have tamed human passion. Yeah. I remember when I was in my teens, I read um, in one book, the uh, comment, was, the quote was made, a youth not yet out of his teens is a poor judge of the fitness of one as young as himself to be his partner for life. <laughs> and if that was true, you know, in the 1800s, oh, yeah. how much more true is it today? Absolutely. You know, in the yeah, 1800s, people grew up with a different maturity level. Yeah. You know, in those days, women women raised their daughters to learn how to do things around the house, and fathers raised their sons to work in the garden and handle animals, and you just grew up with a set of skills in your in your in preparing, most families that were very marriage. practical that prepared you to to be on your yeah. own, and yet we're in a generation now that. If they can't flip a switch and put it in the microwave, they don't know how to do any of it. So you, we've lost that pr that practical skill set. Oh, you say that for it? I was it. Yeah, he said. I for it. I was thinking I've got a knack for it. I was like, an app for that. <laughs> yeah, there's an app for that. An, an app for knack. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we live in that. Well, that means well. that the parents need to think seriously about how they're raising their kids. Because one day they're going to get married, and they need to have practical. Well, when you skills. think about how we had the, um, the college students over here, our mm -hmm. friends, um, they never used an axe. <laughs> like <laughs> trying to figure out how to chop a piece of wood. <laughs> yeah, something as basic as literally just smacking a piece of wood with a piece yeah, of metal. Yeah, like base survival skills. <laughs> well, Will knew because Will was a Boy Scout. Yeah, but it's like you know they they never learned those kind of things mainly because of where they were living and also because their parents just. Never taught them any of that. Well, the parents milk, may not have known either. Milk really comes from cows. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. It came from the grocery store. <laughs> That's right. Some kids have believed that, that milk came from Apparently the Apparently there was like a study done for <coughs> college students somewhere. I think it was like in, in Philadelphia. They were like testing the people there. And I think it was like 60% like of the college students did not know how to or ever have used a hammer. So like they just never even knew like how to use a hammer. What's a hammer? <laughs> yeah. This is pretty crazy. I mean, so so there's a lot going against us in this generation. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're, we're people my age are incredibly underprepared for marriage and especially... Underprepared for life, period. Period. Yeah. I mean, they think, okay, I'm going to go to school, go to college and get a, get a degree and somehow that's going to prepare me for life. Most of them don't even know how to fill out a job application. Well, not only that, they're literally destroying mm -hmm. most of their life when they do that because they don't have an actual goal that requires a degree most of the time. It's called dumbing down. Like most of the time they don't actually have something that warrants having a degree. They do something that warrants, I don't know, it just gives them a lot of debt. And they had to worry about that for a long time. Bottom to consumerism. But that's, a, that's another topic. Um, so, thinking but in that terms means, of... That means as a man and as a woman, if you're thinking about getting married, you need to have your spiritual life up to date. I mean, you can't just go to church and pretend and be the happy couple. The, of yes, you really got to. And one thing's for sure is if you are fake at, in your Christian experience, your spouse will find out very quickly because you will you can't keep up a pretense indefinitely. And so it's really important that you take the time it takes to get to know each other and get get that to know they really do have a spiritual life. Yeah. Because I know when, when Jerry and I were, were dating, when we first met each other, he really wasn't interested in spiritual things much at all. Now and, <laughs> and um, <laughs> he went to church with me the first time just to please me. You know, he didn't really have any interest in being there, but he went because I was going and he went with me. And I remember when there was a, an evangelistic series coming to town and he didn't see any need for that stuff. He, he kind of argued with me about whether he needed to go at all. And I said, well, just go with me to the first meeting. And he went to the, went to the first meeting. And he found out there that if he attended for so many nights, he got a free Bible. I didn't realize he'd never had his own Bible. Hmm. So he got that, and he began to study and began to learn. And I mean, it didn't matter whether I went or not. From then on, he was going. and He, was, he had his Bible. I, I went, went to see him at work one day at the bowling alley. He's back in the back, sitting there where the machines are, reading his Bible. 
and I knew then, you know, this was something he was doing for himself because he wanted to. And that was an important thing. Yeah. Lots of ground points. All right, well, one see, more had, gold had, star for mom, whatever. I had, I had, I had dated a fellow um, in, in the year before I met him. And I had been, you know, watching the way guys were with, you know, with, with, where they behaved with everybody. And this fellow was an assistant pastor. He was a you know, new graduate from theology school. And I really didn't want to date a minister because I'd said, you know, Lord, anything but a doctor or a preacher. But I dated this guy once or twice. And he, had moved, he had moved into his own place. And something happened. I think his stove was broken in the apartment and he had to get someone in to, to try to fix it. And he said, well, I gotta make an appointment to get my car looked at. It's, it's making a funny noise and I'm thinking, he doesn't have any practical skills whatsoever. The problem with the stove, it turned out, was that you had to push the knob in and turn it to get the stove to work. And <laughs> it wasn't working it so he thought it was broken. I can't believe he couldn't have just like yeah. Not even aggressively was he just pushing and twisting. Yeah, it was just, just one of those things where the stone well, I realized <laughs> immediately he has no, he, he'd, he'd grown up, his father was a college professor, a music teacher. He'd grown up in academia. He had never had to learn to do any of those things. He couldn't fix his car. He couldn't even change the oil himself. And I said, you know, I grew up with the, my dad's a machinist and did all kinds do of practical, a do it yourselfer. I did not want to be stuck with a man that couldn't do anything. So on my list of things was somebody who knew how to work with his hands and could fix things. And I meet this mechanic who's working at the bowling alley, and I think, not a preacher or a doctor. <laughs> Good. <laughs> he can do things. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> a couple of months after we were married, the pastor had preaching classes, and he's been preaching ever since. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, well... <laughs> That's great. Did you want Second Corinthians uh, six fourteen? Sure. It says, "Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness?" Yeah. And I don't think today's generation even understands what unequally yoked means. No. Having never seen a team of horses or oxen together, you know that you put them put their heads together in this yoke so that they both walk in no. the same direction. Yeah, it's pretty fun to be in a room full of people around my age or Simeon's age and then you read a passage like this and you go, cool, does anybody know what to be yoked means? And then they all get this really dumb look like they realize that they've been reading it and acting like they agree with what it says and then they have no idea what it's saying. <laughs> you know, and I guess they just never think about it. You know, they just think they understand so they move on. You know, well, you kind of get the gist of it from the rest of the text. Yeah, don't be mixed, don't be... But at the same time, when you are yoked, you are walking side by side, both going in the same direction. Oh, and you're tied together. Yeah. <laughs> and to be unequally yoked would be, for example, to have a slow animal with a fast animal. Or just to have like a, like a, like a little horse with a big horse. Right. That would mean that you'd be end up you'd end Different up with one pulling right one pulling more than the other one, and you would get, you would not get the direction. That back one part's always turning. <laughs> <laughs> I get the best circles in my field. <laughs> yeah, I guess another easy way you could describe it is to put one one set of bigger wheels on one side of your car than the other, and just drive around. <laughs> <laughs> Unequally tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah of course, other than other than the physical stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. I think this is applying more to character and personality. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, you're talking about righteousness versus unrighteousness or lawlessness, etc. You're talking about light versus darkness. Uh, that's more character, uh, that's more personality. That's spirituality. It's spiritual, spiritual stuff, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, there are obvious uh, couples that have. You know, there's obvious physical unequal yokeness. You know, like you're not gonna, uh, like you can't base it on the fact that maybe Elsa's stronger than me or I'm stronger than her or whatever. You know, I mean, that's obviously an area where technically we would be unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. You know, if you ask us both to lift a heavy thing, you know, if we can't both lift it, that's technically uneven. Yeah, we'll try having a kid. A kid? 
Yeah, try having a child. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're unequally there, right? Yeah. yeah. She can do it, but you can't. <laughs> I wouldn't. And you wouldn't want to. <laughs> can and wouldn't. Well, it's like she wouldn't want to probably lift the Susan super. Susan says, says that car would need to be retired. Yeah, retired. <laughs> But yeah, so, so what you're saying is true, though. It's, it's a spiritual parallel, and I, I bring that out in this other passage, too, from Deuteronomy, where it says, uh, Deuteronomy 7, 2 through 4, it says, uh, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, and they may, uh, and they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. That is one of the biggest principles in Scripture that people overlook. Ignore, and they ignore that. Yeah. Because a lot of people, one of the myths that we chatted about last week is that, hey, I can change the other person. I mean, there are some people that go into a relationship and they already know that they have different philosophies about all kinds of things. And of course, spiritual spiritual issues is a big one. Uh, but they think, I'll be able to, you know, I'll be able to influence them. I don't think they'll love me enough them. to change. Or, or, you know, that they love me enough that they'll change for me, that kind of thing. In and fact, if anything, after you've been together for a while, the loving me enough to change is just not even a possibility because you get so relaxed with each other that you become your real selves. And sometimes that real self is a very selfish characteristic. Mm -hmm. And I think if I had one, one bit of counsel to give to any young people that were considering marriage, it's take time to really get to know this person. Watch how they behave with their family, with their parents, watch mm -hmm. how they behave with their friends. Because uh, it used to, be, used to be told, watch how a man treats his mother because that's the way he'll treat you. <laughs> you may slap it around his mom. I didn't expect this at all. <laughs> but yeah, this, yeah. I mean, there's there's obvious precursors that um, that communicate a lot about that. And we'll probably talk more about that as we talk about you know finding a godly woman and all that as well. We can address it now because it's not that complicated. But what you're saying is exactly right. There was a, a sermon I was watching. I forgot the name of the guy. Um, black fellow, really interesting guy. I like he's a good speaker. But um, he was talking about finding a godly woman. And he was saying that, um, you know, people have this issue of looking at the scripture from the standpoint of the wife being submissive to the man. Um, and men going, well, how do I know if my wife will be submissive to me? And he says, by watching how she interacts with her father. And she's, <laughs> he, said, uh, he said, if she's not... If she's not subservient or submissive to the rule of the father who clothes and feeds and protects her, you know, <laughs> you don't think you're so handsome, she's just going to do it for you. You know, like... Interesting uh, point. Yeah. That, I mean, you can well, look it's the at same that. principle that you just yeah. said, you know, yeah. with uh, you can observe the way you're watching and how the man treats his mother. So, I mean, it's the same principle. Yeah. yeah I saw on Facebook, there was a picture of a, a woman with her baby. And she was she was kissing him and he sh and said, "You're his first kiss, his first love. You're the first woman in his life. You know you have an influence." And people people don't understand how far reaching the influence of parents are. And we can we can look at our generation and see that we've got a society that has broken down the family to where is it like sixty or seventy percent of all households have no father in the home. So you've got marriages that are broken, people don't have an example to follow, kids Real don't lives. grow up knowing what a loving father is like. They may have a mother who's working two jobs to try to keep the bills paid and a father who's never a part of their life. And that's what they think is a normal life. What are they going to be looking for when they are old enough to get married? You know, they're going to expect a woman who's going to work two jobs and support them. You know, this is this is why you have to really look at how how the influence because if you set up your home, you are going to influence the next two generations by the way you live and the way you raise your children. I think a lot of kids grow up, of course, as part of society, and, and when they're old enough to perceive, you know, kind of what's what, they they say, "I'm not interested in marriage because it doesn't work." Mm -hmm. Maybe they 
with your parents just without That's the general consensus. Actually, I had a man tell me that not too long ago. He's our age, and he said, and I said, how is it that you've never married? Because he's always chasing after women. And he said, my parents were married for 50, 60 years, and they hated each other. And he said, I don't want that. I don't want to be in a relationship where I'm always angry with someone. Sure. I mean, and and you thought, can well, you've got control over this. Well, you can see that. That's kind of a reason. But that's a the logical sense. I mean, logical, you know, idea there. But, but uh, I mean, it's logical from his view. It's not, I mean. But see, that's, that also addresses a myth. And that is that marriage is going to be this, this picnic. Uh, you know, every single day, and there's be never going to be blissful, uh, yeah, blissful. There's never going to be any challenges and, and, and bumpy roads and that kind of thing. That's also a myth. Yeah, and so the, you know, the main thing that I was drawing out of those passages is just, you know, first the idea of unity being dependent on your relationship with God, and it also being evident that God does not like mixture, and that He doesn't. Want spirit, spiritual mixture more specifically. Well, and, and well not he doesn't want it, but it just can't mm-hmm. work. There's, you know, it's just, it's just not work. And you know, the, the mixture <laughs> of the, the mixture of being, <laughs> not mixture, but the, the unity of both being Christians. What if one of you is a Sabbath keeper and one of you isn't? Even if you're both Christians. What if one of you is in love with living in the city with all the attractions, and one of you wants to live in the country? I mean, you, the, the issues of unity are deeper than just having a, a relationship, relationship with God. It has to be a union, unity of your goals and the things that you want to do with your lives. You know, if I'd married a guy that wanted to live in the city, uh, it would have been miserable because I was committed to raising my family in as much of a rural setting as possible because I believed it was the best opportunity for kids to learn and grow spiritually. But... If he hadn't been committed to doing that, we would never have been able to really enjoy being together and raising a family. We'd only had the one and a half children. The <laughs> one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and that the average is that sort of two and, two and, and a half. Years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mom, what you were saying earlier, too, about the family, though, is a really big one because that's that's been one of the most heavily attacked things in these, I guess, for all time, but especially more in current time, because it's actually even specifically stated as one of the main goals of some of the most prominent feminists that move in society. And they consider it like a landmark for their success, for the fact that so many more people are having babies out of wedlock and moving in together and shacking up. And you know, the, I was Women are having quotes, the freedom. I was reading some quotes from, from some of these ladies, and they were talking about how essentially this is their goal and this is the evidence that what they're trying is working. And they think it's this awesome thing that people are becoming so liberated from the patriarchy, they kept calling it. And, um, you and know. the thing of it is that none of these people actually lived under a patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them probably did not live in a home where some man ruled with an iron fist. You know, and that's what everybody says they're afraid of, you know, the domineering, overbearing male who demands to be respected and submitted to. Nobody would want to live under that. And if you've grown up in a poor home without, without good examples, you are not destined to, put, to, do, to make the family the same when you grow up. You can change that cycle. You can change the pattern that you were raised with. You don't have to live the way you were raised. You can choose to, to raise your children differently. You can choose to find someone that you really have a good relationship with and build a future. You, you don't, you're not condemned to live the way you've always lived. And people need to know parent, that. I think every parent <clears throat> would really wish and hope that their children's relationships would be even better than their own. Definitely. Well, any good parent. Yeah, some parents are jealous and they don't want their kids to succeed, you know, because of pride or some weird things. Those are, those are weird cases. Um, so the next point that I figured we would discuss is the idea of man being the head of the house, um, you know, and in, and in short could be summarized by saying that man is to be a leader. And, uh, you know, I think that's another point that men should have cultivated prior to marriage, is the understanding of appropriate and good leadership, which is yes. hard, huh? 
Uh-huh. How do you define that? Yeah, which is hard if you didn't have a good example of it growing up. You know, <clears throat> if you come from a home where you didn't have a father or a father who was a leader, you know, and you're, you're raised in a society that tells you not to be a leader, but to just, you know, when the bell rings, go to your next class, <laughs> you know, you know, you're not in charge, you're not in whatever. Um, you know, not to be an individual thinker. Uh, I just figured we would discuss for a little bit, you know, what we what we think it means for man to be the head of his household. I um, was just thinking of this text, and I'm trying to get the context of it. Mm-hmm. Genesis 33. Mm-hmm. This is Jacob and Esau. We're going to stop for when they, yeah, when they. When they were, when they they met up and they were able to reconcile their differences, and Esau said, you know, let's go back to the house, and Jacob said, let my lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly, according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my lord and just stay here. So, you know, Jacob said, you know, I want to I want to go go there with you, but I am going to take have to take my time because I have livestock and children. He was t- taking thought for those. He wasn't going to drive them to go do what he wanted to do. He was leading them softly. And I thought that was a really important illustration, a character trait. That Consideration. You, yeah. That some, you, you want a man who is a leader, but who is considerate, you know, what you are able to do, and who recognizes that women and children don't have the same physical stamina and endurance. Well, it's that it's just someone who's logical. If you're someone, you want someone who's... That's right. You want to buy all the tools necessary for your wife to rebuild the engine in the car. <laughs> I mean, and you want to you know, provide all the things necessary for her to, you know, get the garden and cut the grass. And <laughs> just being considerate. <laughs> and that's, that's why I so appreciate that chainsaw he got me for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Chopping by it with the axe was hard, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it didn't leave her time to get the other things done. <laughs> yeah, so... You, you know, a real man, a, a man who loves his wife would not be a slave driver. Who would he would not be someone who would be overbearing and rude and brusque. Unreasonable expectations. Right. Yeah, and a absolutely. woman who loves her husband doesn't mind him being in charge. In fact, most of the women I know would prefer to have the man in charge making most of the decisions and allowing them to do the things they need to do with the home and the kids, not having to deal with all those other extra things that a man often deals with. You know, most of us women don't want to be men. That's, you know, that's the feminist dream. That's not ours. Most of us are fine with being women. Let's see. Susan says, also, a shepherd doesn't go in front. He gently moves the sheep along, but he's behind them. Great point. I think it would be Beatitudes as well. And of course, Not dragging, and, he's and, pushing. And leading, well, yeah, and, and of course following that out there <laughs> is that he's taking him to the place where they can eat. He's taking him to the place where they can drink. He's taking him to the place where they're safe for the night, you know, in, in their sheepfold, etc. So he's, he supported, the shepherd is supporting them. And of course, that's what the good shepherd really does. I, w- well. I would suspect that men working in the shepherding arena, you know, growing up in families where they had to tend to sheep and goats, I think that prepared them a lot for marriage. Because you recognized, here, these, this is your livelihood, this is how you make your income, this is what supports your family, but you can't push them too hard or they get sick and die or they get injured, and you can't force them to do what you want. Have you to be have patient. To, you have to guide them, you have to push, you have to get your staff and nudge them out of the wrong direction. You have to constantly be on them, but you can't abuse them where you lose your livelihood. So I think that probably prepared a lot of men for the realities of living with people because and people are just like that. And then sometimes you need to know uh, when you can push them out of their comfort zone. I remember, There's danger. I remember when we were in Turkey, we were going to cross, uh, we were going to cross a swinging bridge. Right? And when we got there, there was a, a shepherd there, and he was trying to get his herd across the bridge. Right? <laughs> and the sheep went up, uh, they were right there at the, at the, at the beginning of it. But they, they saw that bridge not, moving. And they they saw the bridge moving, and they, you know, in their minds, this is unstable. 
so they would not go on there. And he's hollering at them and you know trying to move them along, and they would not go, right? So what that shepherd did? Good sheep, good sheep. Yeah, it's that shepherd. Oh, that's my philosophy the, too. That bridge is swinging. I'm not on it. That, that shepherd, well, he picked up the one in front there, and he just threw them down, just threw them down <laughs> under the bridge, right? Miscalculates, <laughs> tosses them off the side. So there they go, you know, <laughs> flinging down there onto the bridge, and then when, once he got one or two of them on there. Then the other ones followed. Right? <laughs> but um, you know, he knew that it was be beneficial for them to get the other side, but they did not want to go on that bridge. But it wasn't until after he got them on there that they realized, well, there is something solid under our feet, even though it is kind of swinging a little bit. Um, and and he, he was able to get them crossed. You know? But I thought that was kind of interesting. Susan says, in the workaday world, those are transferable skills. Apparently, the ability to lead yeah. oh, without yeah. without drive. I mean, think about if you've ever had a boss and that was good. overbearing and rude and mean spirited. Oh yeah, you're you're definitely not. It just sucks all the joy out of you trying to Absolutely. go to a job where you've got to deal with somebody like yeah. that. But somebody who really leads. I remember one of my um, employers used to say that he hired me because I knew so much more than he did, and he said he always preferred to to run with the race horses rather than chase after the dogs. <laughs> he said he'd rather he'd rather hire somebody that knew more than he did because he could get they could get more done. Yeah, well that's a, that's that's a good that's very leadership secure. Trait. Yeah, that's somebody who's very secure in their position. Right. Yeah, and that's somebody who doesn't have so much pride. Well a lot of people will feel threatened by that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean that's a huge part of leadership right there is, you know, being the first to uh, you know, being the first to go. Or, you know, I, I tell people this as well because you know, when teaching groups of kids, when they're like part of a certain class group, like our homeschool group, you know, we played a game um, where we had to get from one side of the room to the other without touching the floor. You know, we call it the floor is lava. But the you, you guys play that when you guys were kids. I, mean, I can oh, yeah. remember. I remember seeing the kids going from sofa to chair to sofa, <laughs> back around the room, and hopping and going, What are you doing? Is it the floor is lava? Yeah. You can't touch yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, really, that's what parkour is. This is just the floor is lava on a big scale, but. Um, but so what, what I do to, to, with, to teach about leadership with that game is I say, okay, we only are successful when everybody's over there. And each time it gets harder. We get to one target and I say, awesome, you pick our next target. And I change the leader every time. And I say, you're picking your next target. And then I say, you pick an obstacle to eliminate that we can no longer use. And we keep doing this until there's very limited amounts of obstacles so to use. Until they're just like trying to traverse the whole room with only three obstacles they can touch. You know, and it gets really intense. And the, the guys are super macho and strong, and they power their way through, and they're waiting on the other side for everybody else to catch up. And the people who are the weakest are struggling in the back and can't make it, but we don't win until everybody's there. And so I wait for them to, to understand that the concept of the game is to learn that they're there to help and support each other so they can all make it. And, um, you know, so they uh, they pick that up eventually, and, and what I tell them at the end is that the leader is not the guy who gets there first and is in the front. He's the guy in the back of the weakest person, and Help, he's, helping. he's the guy helping the weakest person succeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a phenomenal just, skill to teach. I bet you there are a lot of parents who love that. Probably that's such an I mean, illustration yeah. of what Christ <laughs> did. Yeah. I mean, here is the Creator of the universe coming down here and becoming a man so he can help the weakest mm -hmm. achieve eternity. Well, <laughs> and so to, to add to that point, you know, for time's sake, since we're going to run over just a little bit here, um, you know, the, the other point that I had that I'll just mention, and then we'll go to the fourth point, which I think is relevant to what we're branching into here. My third point was um, being patient, loving, and kind, which is based on um, a number of different scriptures. You know, if you just read about in Titus, like the role of a bishop, or in 1 Timothy 3, I'll jump to that real quick and read that one because it is good, but, uh, and then we'll talk about the fourth point, which is the one that I think is the most important, and is probably the point that most people overlook. You might want to save that for next week. You think so? Okay, then we'll talk about the third point then, and we'll just bring up the fourth point when we're uh, concluding mm -hmm. next week. So, First uh, Timothy chapter three. Qualifications of overseers. Where we're headed. Or deacons. C. 
but I think it's also relevant to um, to, to being a man in general, since that is who it's talking about. So, First Timothy chapter three. I'll read that one here. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, there's so much information in there that I feel like people in my generation gloss over, but this is really describing the mature man, Mm -hmm. I think. You know, that that seems to be my observation. I I think back to all the church nominating committees we sat on and think about how difficult it would be to even find a man who who could could, could fit 75%. Of those things, yeah. you know, because we have we have devalued men in this generation so far that we have wimped them down to where they, you know, they can't have an opinion of their own because somebody might be offended. They can't stand for anything because it might not be politically correct, and they certainly can't be committed to their their home and family because that's not popular in this generation. Even more obviously is the is the beatitudes which people read all the time and have no clue what it means. And that really just means to be like a man. Or to even just be like completely solid. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll pick up more on this topic um, next week. But, you know, in terms of uh, kind of ending or summing up what I think is one of the greatest parts that I didn't fully understand or consider when I first got married, and um, we'll talk more about that next week, and and see where we go from there, might talk about the role of a woman, and how how they relate to each other, and uh, just see where we go. It's pretty pretty cool studying this stuff out. It is. And uh, it it does a lot to, to strengthen your marriage, because when you start to read and study stuff like this, you start to try and apply it. And it's kind of neat to see how it works in different ways. Mm-hmm. So. Want to give us some examples here? <laughs> Are you testing me without me knowing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it, it relates more specifically to what we'll talk about next week in terms of what I've been trying to put into practice. So, but I mean, you know, most of this stuff is also good to put into practice, you know, practicing patience and, you know, all the other things it mentions there. Like you said, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who could actually match even 75% of the description of what you should be looking for in a bishop. Not to say that they aren't there, but those are the people who are real men. <laughs> you know, in the, in the in the godliest sense, I could think. And um, they're few and far between, I think. So, unless there's any other thoughts what we've talked about so far. A lot of food for thought. There is. I mean, like I said, it's one of the most heavily attacked roles in society today. So it's it's hard to... to the enemy's been, at, been trying to destroy the home and the family, and he's done a really good job in this last 50 or 60 years. Mm-hmm. I, mean, it, it, I think that's just because it's gotten so convenient to do anything you really want now. Like back then when you were, when you were like courting and stuff and parents were setting you up, um, it's way harder to be independent and something like that because it's like you didn't have the option to get your own car at 16, to be able to be, to, to be able to travel the entire United States in one day. Right. Like you, you, you don't realize how much freedom you're given 
in this country and in this age because of all the things that we've made for convenience. It's awesome that we have all these progressions, but it's also what is befalling us for our families. Because it's so convenient to be independent now. It's so easy to be alone. I can go to college halfway across the world and then move somewhere else. I mean, it's, you know, it, families are disconnected now. And um, I think it all started, you know, a generation, two or three generations earlier than this one. Yeah, I think this is just because we're noticing it now because it's gotten so far. We're like, dang, we're really separated. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, in, in, you miss in an inch, you miss previous model. generations, you pretty much stayed in the same community you were born in. And when you raised your kids, you raised them in that community, and a lot of your relatives were there. Yeah. If your kids got out of line, somebody in the family was there to stop them, correct them, <laughs> let, or let you know that they were doing something they weren't supposed to, which had yeah, positive and negatives. But, you know, that, I can remember when the boys were, were, the older boys were younger, they, would get, they got their licenses. Different people in town would tell me when one of my kids was rip roaring through town at a high speed. And I'd confront one of them. They'd say, how'd you find that out? You know? I said, we moved here because this is small town America. This is much more of what our parents' generation was raised with. And I said, despite the fact that you don't know them, they know who you are. And they know how to get in touch with me. Now, in a, in a bigger metropolitan area, if they were living in Christiansburg or Roanoke or something like that, that would never have happened. Yeah. But because this is a much more of a community, and because people were concerned. They didn't want to see this this you kid hurt. act silly and wreck his car and get injured. You know, they they'd seen enough tragedy out here. They were concerned about their safety and concerned about their, their behavior and it was fine, you know. But it was just always funny that they wanted to know how did I found out. But see if you, when you live in that community where you have extended family, everybody in that community feels a sense of responsibility to make sure each other is safe and Try to try to take care of each other if possible, yeah. and it's it's a it's a community skill that we've lost. We've lost that whole concept of community. Yeah, I think it's really because you become world. independent. Like independent. <laughs> Not only independent. I, I was thinking about it this week. You know, there's so many things that we lost with with this technology that we don't we that we take for granted now. For example, 75 years ago, you might have had a car. The one thing that didn't exist was air conditioning. So when you drove in the summertime, it was hot, and you rode with the windows down. Now I've been driving the Altima both back and forth, and as I drove into town yesterday, it was warm, and I could smell all of the flowers along the roadway. Now if I'd been driving in a regular car with air conditioning, I would never have, see, have smelled that or appreciated it. How many things do we not get to appreciate because we have sealed ourselves off in our our own little world. Um, in the old days, it used to be when it got hot, you didn't stay in the house. It was too hot to stay in the house. In the evening, you went out and sat on the porch where it was cool. And the Dad kids played, played the banjo. Somebody was <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't necessarily do any of that, but you, you sat there. You sat on the porch. The kids played in the yard. If there were neighbors, you talked back and forth across the fence or whatever. Now we go into our air conditioned houses. We don't talk. We don't know who our neighbors are. We don't even make well, eye contact. That's what I was talking about. Being, you can be completely independent. Like you and don't have to go. Play the band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we've lost musical skills. Yeah. We have, in part, because that was that was the form of entertainment. In the days before, you had movies and internet and radio and all that other stuff. In fact, like the radio was music. was such a revolutionary thing because people Push could get on there and, and, li and, and listen to people <laughs> all like, across the world. And that was that was pretty exciting stuff. And 30 minutes pushing buttons and you have a song. <laughs> My grandfather was one of the few people in his community who had a radio. And he had a, a big old battery for it and he had to crank it up and charge that battery. And they liked listening to the boxing matches. And then friends would come on Saturday night or whatever and listen to the boxing matches at my grandfather's house. He just punched yeah. his lights out. You can't see it, but he just punched his lights out. <laughs> I imagine the announcers were a lot again. more descriptive. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's just interesting. Oh, to the job. It's interesting what we, we have gained all of this great stuff with technology, but there's so much that we've lost that we don't even know we've lost it. Yeah, and yeah. the generations, like our generations, won't even know we've lost it. I think it's just taking for granted all the stuff that you have. Because, like, I don't know, I don't know anybody my age who appreciates the same thing I appreciate. Like, being able to just walk for miles in the woods and just enjoy 
walking around and being outside and like and just enjoying exploring stuff. Most guys your age, once they have a car, they don't walk anywhere. Exactly. And now I run up walls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that. I mean that, that's when that's I was true. your age. That's what I was doing, and all my friends went different directions, and I kept doing it. <laughs> so. Now they're all of death. I could, I could honestly <laughs> still play an imaginary gun game in the woods today. Like, I could I could still oh, do that. That was one of my dreams. One of my weird dreams was you and I were walking around playing imaginary games I could, I could still do it today. But we were totally our I, age. I know <laughs> that my friends could yeah. not do that anymore. Like, like um, I was talking... lost that imagination. I was talking to some of my friends, you yeah. know, like, I don't think I could ever, like, you know, go back in the woods and just have, have an awesome time just playing a game in your, like, with your imagination or sticks and stuff. It's like, I could still do that. I could still totally have fun just running around with a stick. And so we, we can chat more about all this, uh, you know, while we eat or something. Um, to, you know, to, to summarize what we've talked about today is pretty much the idea of just discussing points on what men should be and perhaps what both people should be, really. I think it was general enough that it could apply both ways. Uh, what we should be when we're... We, we talk about women one time, too, some of that. We will. Yeah, we are. We're, we're going to try to talk about both more in depth because they do have very specific roles and very talk about one important. Part, we talk about the other part. and very important distinctions in our in our job descriptions. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll discuss more of that in depth. But for now, we will pray and see what we do for the rest of the Sabbath. All right, uh, Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. The weather is just awesome, and we ask that you would. Help us to enjoy fellowship together today, to enjoy the Sabbath, and to get the benefit of the rest that you have offered us today. We thank you for our family time where we've got to be together and to really dig into your word, and we ask that you would continue to give us understanding on the matter of what type of men and what type of women we ought to be to please you and to please each other, and how we might uh, be able to have that beautiful, harmonious relationship with each other in marriage. And uh, continue to prepare our hearts for that as we study over the coming weeks. Help us to be good stewards of your word and of your resources. And continue to uh, be with us throughout the week as well. And uh, help us to be a blessing to those around us. And of course, Lord, most prominently help us to be more like your son. And help us to be fit representatives. And help us to, uh, to do the things that we are called to do by your name. This we ask and pray in the name of your son. Amen. Mm -hmm. Again, Susan said, when both have the focus of serving the other with Jesus in the forefront, it is one of the best things there is in life. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yep. The thing is, people people think it's 50-50. It's 100 100 It's like 100 100 Thanks for joining us once again, everyone out there, and uh, we hope that uh, the Lord continues to bless the rest of this day until we get together next week. So, until then.